The Last Nephilim Prologue Meeting Dr. Persis Falzon It is doubtful that many will accept the account I present to you as factual. Consequently, I am publishing it as fiction. Believe me when I say that I have questioned the utility of transcribing this story at all. However, I find that the older that I get, the more intense my desire for purpose grows. Not purpose as in career, but as in higher purpose. I'm convinced that there is information in this story that will prove deeply enlightening for many. Presuming that you accept the veracity of this manuscript, you have come upon answers to some vexing historical mysteries that have stumped scholars for millennia. The account you are about to hear has enlightened and motivated me, and it is my hope that others such as you may similarly benefit. There is no use trying to pretend that I am an objective witness to some of the events. I'm sold. I believe that the wild adventure, as told to me by my patient, Persis Falzon, is true. Where do I begin? Let's start by telling you a little bit about myself. I am a psychiatrist working at a community mental health clinic in southeastern Michigan. I am never bored. Every patient has a tale to tell that is worthy of a book, and a few deserve an appearance on The Jerry Springer Show. My most interesting patient ever came to my office in the fall of 2001 for treatment of what was described in his intake form as an adjustment disorder with suicidal ideation. He was reportedly experiencing anxiety concerning a recently diagnosed skin disease. According to his introductory documentation, Mr. Falzon was a retired physician with licenses to practice in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, Greece, Egypt, and England. I had never encountered such a widely credentialed physician in my entire life. I figured he was either some kind of missionary or a member of the World Health Organization. The intake form didn't say whether he had a specialty, but as I read the chart further, I came to presume that he was an infectious disease specialist. Several years ago, the doctor had apparently contracted treatment-resistant leprosy while working at Guy's Hospital in central London, resulting in the loss of toes from his left foot. I recall these details vividly without having to refer to my case records because his was the only case of leprosy I had ever seen in my entire medical career. Prior to Dr. Falzon, my last exposure to leprosy was when I saw the movie Ben-Hur as a child. Actually, at the University of Michigan where I graduated from medical school, we did spend about 15 minutes on the subject of leprosy during an infectious disease module. As far as I knew, most of the time, it was treatable. But one thing that the 20th century has taught us is that hospitals are excellent petri dishes for drug-resistant pathogenic microorganisms. It was, and still is, my habit to briefly read through the intake paperwork before seeing the patient if time permits. As amazed as I was about the leprosy, what piqued my interest most about this man was why he was at a community mental health clinic instead of a private medical office. What doctor goes to a community medicine facility for treatment? CMH is for the indigent. I had treated other physicians in that humble setting only after they had lost their licenses or were retired for several years. Some of those treated were graduates of foreign medical schools and they were unable to practice legally in the United States because they couldn't pass their American board exams. What was his story? When Amy, one of my clerical staff, brought him to my office. The first thing that I noticed was how very dark and thick his long curly hair was on the top of his head. Considering that the birth date on his forms made him over 69 years old, he didn't appear anything like I expected. Most of the gray in his hair was focused around the temple and sideburns. He was dressed in a clean white ensemble sporting white denim pants and a long white sleeved polyester turtleneck shirt with brown leather-laced shoes. He had an authoritative comportment about him. His gait was brisk and youthful as he followed me into the waiting room of my office. There were several other indications that he was much younger than his stated age. His build was slender and muscular, with no evidence of elderly stoop in his upper spine. Also noted were muscular forearms and biceps, and rather broad, rounded deltoids. He stood about four inches taller than me at six foot one or two. He had a square jaw and an olive skin complexion that I originally suspected was of Middle Eastern origin. I judiciously surveyed the exposed skin 
and saw no lesions. He smiled confidently as he shook my hand firmly in greeting. Mild laugh lines appeared on his face, betraying that he had been around for a while. But in that face, there weren't enough wrinkles or deep enough lines to prove that he was nearly 70 years old. Under his left arm, he carried a large black leather notebook the size of a small briefcase that was zipped shut. Hello, Dr. Falzon. I'm Dr. Broomfield. That is my standard line when greeting new patients. What brings you to the office today? I motioned for him to sit on the couch while I reclaimed my seat behind my rather cluttered wooden desk. He continued to stand and started to speak, but stopped himself short. Don't you have another question? A more pressing question that's been bothering you, Dr. Broomfield? He asked, raising his left eyebrow. For a moment, I was dumbfounded as to what he was referring to. To be honest, I suspected he was psychotic at that point. He believes that he can read my mind or something, I thought. Already I was calculating which antipsychotic I needed to get him on. Apparently he could tell by my expression that I was ignorant as to the subject of his query. Have you seen any of the data that came from Common Ground? The referral agency that sent me to you? Didn't you wonder why I came here to see you, given my career and all? I was clueless, but I played along. Oh, yes, yes, I stammered. Please, have a seat. I gestured toward the couch again, which was directly across from my desk. Could I sit in the chair instead, he asked. The chair is next to the door and closer to my desk. People with bad backs, weakened legs, or the morbidly obese tend to prefer the chair. He didn't offer any explanation for his preference. Sure, no problem. Have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. He promptly plopped down in the chair. I was curious about something. I started. How did you financially qualify to be seen at this clinic? I have seen the adult children of other physicians, but it is rare for me to treat a physician as a patient in this community mental health setting. Are you unable to practice in the U.S. anymore? I asked. He smiled, and there was an awkward pause. A devilish smirk materialized across his face, and he directed his gaze out the window to my right. I'll be up front with you. I lied to the intake worker and forged some income tax forms to make it look like I was less than middle class. He could see I was gobsmacked by that admission. I was thinking, man, is this dude cheap or what? His eyes shifted back to me, and his smile became less devious. No, I'm not some kind of miser who is desperate to save a buck. I know what you're thinking, Dr. Broomfield, and that is not it. He knows what I'm thinking, does he? So, we're back to the psychotic diagnosis, I mused. He continued. I've done at least a little research. I checked out your credentials on the Internet after attending one of your lectures at the Troy Community Center, and I came here specifically to see you. I want you to listen to my story and record it. What kind of stalker weirdo was I dealing with? Do I look like a transcriptionist? I wondered. What about my credentials drew you to me? I asked. He leaned forward and spoke slowly while making unbroken eye contact with me. I don't know of any other author or psychiatrist that would understand the variegated aspects of my story. I don't want to get into all of that now, though. You'll just have to hear the story to understand. He then unzipped his notebook and pulled out a stack of papers clipped together at one corner. It looks to me like you've already done some writing. What do you need me for? I asked. I had no intention of complying with his expectations if it involved listening to his psychotic poetry. Doctor, if I write a book about myself with this kind of material in it, I will not be taken seriously. Trust me, in order for this to receive serious consideration, I need someone objective with more credibility than I have. Let me guess. The government is spying on you. And there is a sinister plot to foil your plan to reveal God's personal message to the world, taunted my jaded psychiatrist mind. I decided to let him continue his rant, so I could discern the full manner of delusion he was experiencing. My attention shifted to the contents of his notebook. What do you have there? I asked. Well, for one thing, it has to be the longest-running literary work in progress in history. It has been written and rewritten in many languages, including a few that are now dead. 
After the dead languages, it was translated a couple of times into Greek. Later, I rewrote it in Latin. Then, I translated it into English. But the language changed so fast that I have had to update recently to contemporary American English, which is very dissimilar to the last English translation, which was completed in A.D. 1638. His credibility wasn't getting any stronger. It was then I concluded, no way is this guy a doc. 1638, I repeated slowly. You're going to need this, he continued, thrusting his papers in my direction, to get a more complete picture of our history. Our history, I repeated. What happened to my history? I was starting to feel that I was losing control of the interview, and I needed to get back to the normal psychiatric examination format so I could get the information that I needed to come up with a diagnosis and justify my treatment plan. I was halfway there, having narrowed it down to something with the word psychotic in it. Mr. Falzon, I'm sorry, but I don't have time to read your novel. I'm sure that it's very good and... interesting. And I'm really sorry, but we only have 90 minutes for your psychiatric examination today. I need to ask you questions about your history and symptoms and, of course, your mood. He shot me a bemused schoolteacher glance, as if I had obnoxiously pooted out loud during his lecture. I pressed on anyway. For example, are you hearing voices? Do you feel that someone is plotting against you or watching you? I don't need to read a detailed book about your family to make a diagnosis and prescribe treatment for you. I'm here to help you. You can simply tell me the pertinent material. I don't have time to read that. I insisted, pointing to the manuscript. Undeterred and confident, he dropped the three-pound stack onto my desk directly in front of me with a whack. When you realize the nature of the situation before you, you will want to read it, and I know that you will read it. I guarantee it. He spoke with such a knowing certitude that I found him offensive momentarily. After all, wasn't I the doctor here? At this point, I was convinced that the man was suffering from grandiose delusions. I was willing to bet the farm that he wasn't a doctor. His whole story before the intake worker had been a fabrication. I was 100% certain that he was either schizophrenic or manic with grandiose delusional ideation or on some really psychedelic drugs. As accusatory thoughts were coursing through my mind, to my horror, he did something that shook me to the bone. In my mind's eye, I can still see the event in slow motion. Prior to his having arrived in my office, I had done something very imprudent. Allow me to set it up for you. I really like homemade bread. As most people, I enjoy the smell of it, and I love the taste of fresh, baked, warm bread. I am the only psychiatrist at the clinic that has a Kenmore electric bread maker in his office. Actually, I should say had, because later administration made me put it in the kitchen. Anyway, before they made me move it, I would get into the office and put the ingredients into the machine around 9.30 a.m. I then pushed the buttons, and by lunchtime the delicious aroma filled the office, and I had a treat to look forward to. Anyway, I had just cut a big slice of bread for myself just before Dr. Falzon's appointment. I have a giant steak knife for the cutting of the bread, because when I went to the Walgreens next door looking for bread knives, they didn't have any bread knives. So, I bought a 10-inch steak knife. Normally, after I cut the bread, I put the knife back into the cabinet drawer behind me. When I bought the blade, I considered the risks, and I vowed that patients would never see that little saber sitting on my desk. But of course, on this day, on the day of the doctor's visit, I had absent-mindedly left the knife sitting on my desk within reach of the patient. I was completely blind to it. I'm a pack rat, and my desk was messy. Persis had not been similarly blinded. In one sudden motion, the old guy grabbed the knife with his right hand before I could react. He raised the knife high over his outstretched left hand that was planted in front of me on my desk, and in a flash, he forcibly hammer-speared the weapon down into his left wrist, driving the blade all the way through into the wooden desk underneath. My mind went blank at first as I sat in disbelief at what had just happened. 
When I convinced myself that I was not in the middle of a really horrific dream, my thoughts started streaming again. My career, it's over. Then came, I am so dead, followed by, 